becoming um, a destination for those that are seeking to benefit from uh, this novel uh, medical intervention, at least to uh, for them to get some quality uh, life. Now, we have had various uh, challenges of late with uh, the increase of people looking at Kenya as, uh, as the destination uh, for organ uh, transplant, organ uh, 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 donation. And this has uh, made it become prone to various abuses which have occurred uh, over time uh, during the transplantation uh, period. Now, we have had various uh, guiding principles, uh, guiding regulations that uh, helps or oversees the process of transplantation. And today uh, we have Dr. Nthula Nthusi, who will be helping us uh, to unpack the ethical issues surrounding the organ uh, transplant. Now, I believe so many of you would be having questions on how to uh, uh, address the various ethical issues arising out of this particular practice. Uh, we urge that we type our questions and uh, we'll be responding to them in due course. Now, Dr. Nthusi is uh, a medical doctor. Uh, uh, particularly, he's a consultant, uh, family physician, and a bioethist. Uh, he works, or uh, he's based in Machakos County, and uh, his educational background is a uh, Bachelor of uh, Medicine and Surgery, uh, Moy University, uh, Master's in Medicine, Family Medicine, again from the same university, and Masters of Arts in Bioethics from Trinity uh, International University in USA. Now, as far as affiliations are concerned, Dr. Ari is a member of the Kenya Medical Association a Research and Ethics Committee. Uh, Again, is a member of Bioethics Society of Kenya, a member of the Technical Working Group of Organ Donation, Kenya Blood Transfusion and Transplant Services, and he is the vice chairperson of Kenya Association of Family Physicians and also a director of medical services, Machakos County, and a family medicine educator at uh, Kabarak University. As for his interests, uh, primarily he's interested in primary healthcare practice and education, bioethics, and also leadership and management uh, in the health uh, sector. Now, allow Daktari to address you on this important point uh, and uh, every other questions uh, we should be able to uh, type and uh, we'll be responding to those questions. Thank you very much, Fleming. If you could allow me to share my screen and also my enable video, if you'd like me to. Yes, you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, I'm not able to start my video. Um, I'm not sure if that's a setting on your end, but I can just continue as it is. Just continue. Our technical team is working on it. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Fleming, for the introduction. I will not go back to that. And just as a way of um, ice breaking, as we look at the ethical issue in, in organ donation and, and transplant, which as, as, as Fleming introduced is an emerging issue in uh, contemporary uh, bioethics. 
issues that we encounter or we are looking in the, in the foreseeable future to encounter. So imagine that you are in this scenario. There's a train, there's a train cut or a trolley that is uh, self-driven It's on the rails. So it's going in a straight line. And if it continues to go on the straight line, there are some five people at the far end of the line and they are tied to the truck so they cannot run away. And so this cart or this trolley, if nothing is done, can move all the way and crush the five people, probably seriously injuring them or even killing them. And there is a possibility of a diversion or rerouting of the cart or the trolley to this other truck, which has only one person also tied to the truck. So they cannot leave also, they cannot run away. So you have two options. This is you uh, next to a control lever. You have two options. One is can do nothing, just stand there for things to take their course. Or you can pull this lever, divert this train or this trolley to the one person. What options will you take? You can just put it on the, on the chat or think about it as a reflection in a minute or a few seconds. Will you leave it, do nothing, let it proceed? Will you pull this lever and divert it to this other truck that has only one person? In other words, will you opt to do nothing, kill five people, or will you opt to kill one person and save the five? Maybe using the, the reactions, how many would do nothing and let it proceed? Kill the five. Can do a thumbs up or put something, a reaction that will pop up on the screen so that we see. Okay, I see one, two. Okay, they are coming. All right. Let's look at the other category. How many would pull the lever, reroute the trolley, save the five, and, and kill one person? Okay, these ones are coming in a bit more numbers. Nice. So I think we are clear on that. Most people would opt to sacrifice one person and save the five. All right. Let's move on to the next scenario. Let's say you are on top of that structure. I wouldn't want to call it a bridge or an overwalk or an overpass. And there's this fat guy next to you. You know very well if you push him down, he will stop the trolley and he will save the five. So once again, how many would let the trolley proceed and not push the guy who is next to you, trusting you, trusted friend of you that is there? Okay. Good. How many would push him down to save the fight? All right, again, I think here there are a bit of a 60-40 situation, 40-60 situation, okay? Good. Now, this is a self-driving car. And 
On the zebra crossing, there are two individuals. One is a toddler who is crawling, and option B is uh, an elderly and older adult, a granny, probably a granny to the, the toddler. I know now there are safety checks, so self-driven cars, but assuming you are the one designing this or, or, or to in control remotely or automatic design of this, when it comes to this scenario, because this is somewhere in the countryside, not, not in town. So the car should not stop. Car should continue moving. So which, which program would you insert in the, in the car or in the technology if it ever reaches such a scenario? Should it go for the toddler or go for the grand? A, how many would program that it goes for the toddler? Okay, nobody is voting. Well, it, it's, not, it's not you now, but what would you rather happens in such a scenario if this car was out of control? Would it be A? Let's start with those who feel it should go to A. How many feel it should go to B? All right, interesting. So there was no single vote for A. Interesting. And and so many thumbs up for, for B. Um, now, you are in the accident and emergency center like I've just come from, and you have brought five survivors with injuries. And you have been, you've almost, uh, you've been working, you know, to, to, on one that had come earlier. And if you spend the time, if you were to save this one person, because you are the only um, attending uh, specialist there, it will take you probably uh, five hours and, and you will save his life. If you focus on the five that have severe but relatively uh, less severe injuries than this other one, you will, you will save all of them, the five, but then this one will die. But if you went for this one, you will save them, the one person, but the other five will die. So how many will concentrate on what they are doing? This one patient who was there earlier. Versus how many would leave that and attend to these five one by one, save them, and eventually losing this one. So let's vote again. Who would continue as they were doing with the one patient? Are those the votes for that? Thumbs up. Okay, and how many would leave that one patient and go for the five who they can all save, leave the one? All right, again, looks like a 60-40, but with a bias to the five. So I, I hope this serves as a, an introduction to some of the issues that we are going to discuss today. The discussion is mainly going to be an advocacy, um, awareness creation on the ethical issues which uh, we encounter in healthcare, and more specifically, the ethics around organ donation. And to begin, I would just like to do a little comparison between laws, morality, and ethics. So laws are basically the do's and don'ts. They are formal rules of the bare minimum of the basic and possible standard of behavior. However, you cannot enforce all behavior or conduct, especially dealing with human beings. So the law is silent or limited on some issues. Take, for example, 
in a public service vehicle or a bus, for example, we have law or legislation that limits the speed that the bus should take on the highway. Now that's enforceable. Inside that bus, there is also an enforceable rule on how many passengers it should have. But let's say there's an extra one or two passengers, and one of those extra ones is a pregnant lady who is in a third trimester. There's no law, there's no law that governs or that enforces if anyone should give up their seat for this pregnant lady. So this is where you move to the next consideration, which is morality. Is it right or wrong to let a pregnant woman in a third trimester stand when you can give up the, your seat? Nobody will take you to court. No law you'll be breaking. But then the philosophy of doing right and wrong will come into play. Okay? And it's in an informal framework. Every culture, every um, individual have their own value systems. Some will quickly, as soon as they see, shoot up and ask her, please, ma'am, sit. And probably others would wait the bystander attitude or talk to the conductor or the, 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 the driver. Why are you picking an extra person when there is no seat? All those are not written in any law, but this is where morality comes in. Now, somewhere along the journey, let's say it was a long trip, the lady begins to cramp, goes into labor, and is precipitate. So we have no time to take her to a facility. And you are a doctor, midwife, a healthcare worker with capacity to conduct a delivery, or at least you have the level of skill that is anticipated. And the bus, again, legislation has a first aid kit. So you gave her the seat. Now you're standing, but she has gone into labor. So this is where ethics comes in. Because we find that uh, ethics examines the moral system that govern our conduct and is a justification. So I'm skilled to attend to this emergency. Should I step up, get on to assisting um, this patient or this, this uh, client, or should I just keep quiet and not tell anyone that I am a doctor or I'm a midwife? Should I just maintain status quo and somehow pray that someone else or some, some volunteer or someone in the crowd uh, goes ahead? This is where ethics comes in. So you have medical ethics, legal ethics, and every organized group or community or institution have their own set of ethics, standards, norms. So that's as an introduction. And the ethics itself has also theories. So while we were saying that some of you would, wouldn't want to pull the lever, wouldn't want to turn. You did not cause this scenario or situation in the first place. So why even get into it? You know, uh, taking any decision will force you to participate in the act, which, why are we having a self-driving cart in the first place? You know, why are people tied up on the race? Can stand and do nothing. But the focus on the results of the actions, regardless of the intention, you did not intend to kill anyone in the first place. So will doing nothing save anyone, kill more, kill less? 
So utilitarianism is one theory that tells us that we focus on the results. So if they are going to have a good uh, result, usually happiness. Generally, people will be happy with you if you save more people um, than less. So that's utilitarianism. I'm just really introducing the basic theories of um, ethics. And then virtual ethics is where now you're duty bound to put in place measures or actions or intentions that are inherently the right thing to do. So we should have already uh, measures. We should not have uh, self-driving cars, self-driving cars on their own, with uh, you know, with no mechanism to address unforeseen um, concerns. So we have a duty or moral duty to do that. And the third and not the last one is deontology, where these are universal rules. Whether there is any law from any religion or any culture, lying is generally a bad thing to do um, universally. You know, killing is, is also a bad thing to do. Stealing is bad. You do not have to read or be aware of any law or be under any religion. Those are just some of the ethical theories because we are going to see there is no right or wrong answer when it comes to ethics. It's always um, incidental, contextual, and holistic. We have to explore. If it's about donating, you, you, you may want to donate your organ, but you may want to control or decide who received it. I've been having a discussion this week uh, with some friends and colleagues, and generally about just blood donation. And there are those who feel, why should I give my blood only for someone to go and sell it to become a millionaire out of it, you know? But if I know I have a relative who needs blood and my blood is compatible, I will very quickly go ahead and give. But is that the right thing to do? Based on that context, someone might be right, okay? If I am brain dead, but I have healthy organs, is it okay for me to indicate somewhere that please take my kidney, take my heart, let it benefit someone else who might need it? Those are discussions which will have to be contextual. Should you force me that as long as I live in Kenya, that is the the rule, or should there be an opt-out mechanism where, yes, I know that is the, the rule, but then I really wouldn't want uh, that to happen. I prefer to be cremated. I wouldn't want to keep my uh, organ. But then on the flip side, in case both kidneys, I mean, in case my liver or any other organ fails, will I be, accept, will I be willing to accept an organ for my fellow human being, whether it is a relative or non-related uh, or a friend. So those will be the scope. And the history of um, you know, ethics has been long in, in, in medical research and, and practice. I won't belabor the rest, the, the timeline, but you can pick the years and the highlights and the review. But in 1974 is when we had the Belmont report that gave us the four principles of ethics. I believe that all healthcare workers, all doctors uh, know. Autonomy, you know, the freedom to do as one pleases. So do not force me to do anything. Let me choose what to wear, what to do, what to eat, where to go. But catch with autonomy is then it has to be an informed choice. Because if you, if a child just says, I do not want to go to school and it's my right to autonomy, 
what is the right thing to do as a parent or as a guardian. Allow them just to enjoy their autonomy and sit, stay, whatever it is they're doing. So this has to be an informed uh, choice. The patient does not want to consent to or is not ready to consent to a certain procedure which is life-saving. Do they have all the information that there's probably no alternative uh, and there's more benefit than harm with that decision they are being recommended to? Or will you just quickly hand them, you know, sign against medical advice and so autonomy, freedom for choice, but informed choice? Non-maleficence and um, beneficence are related. But the point here is first, do no harm in presence of a situation you can handle. So the first thing should be uh, you're willing to help, but your help should not cause any harm. So harm should be the first consideration. Am I causing any harm? And it goes down to even selecting modalities of therapy or interventions. If you can give oral medication that will achieve the same uh, uh, plasma levels and treat the patient or relieve the pain, why go for an in injection, travenous or intramuscular, which will achieve the same within the same duration? Um, yeah, then beneficence is generally saying the, the sum of all the benefits should be more than the sum of all the um, harm or discomfort that your intervention is going to take. And then finally, justice. What every individual or every identity deserves needs to be granted. Um, so if we say, once you give your blood or your organ or your tissue, then we have a waiting list. And that waiting list is transparent. We know that we have a waiting list of 100 or 1,000 for patients who need a kidney. If one becomes available in the national uh, you know, system, it should go to that one person, regardless of who they are. We should not have a short uh, circuit into the system that no, this one belongs to a prominent person, so we are going to accelerate them through the list. So those are the four uh, fundamental uh, principles for ethics in whichever discipline we have. And when you now look at the moral philosophies, we went through autonomy, but there are two others that I would just need to touch over briefly. Heteronomy is where there is influence of culture and spirituality. There are certain cultures that prescribe how somebody should dress or whether somebody should receive or not receive certain interventions, maybe a transfusion or even um, immunization or um, whether they should cover their full bodies or dress whatever they want. This is heteronomy because this is not any law. This is not your choice. You would have wished to dress in a particular way, but the culture prescribes. There are people who wake up and they look at what their horoscopes are saying. This is spirituality. That today, you should not involve yourself with critical decisions. You're likely to be wrong. Or you're likely to be in luck if you bet today. And they use that as their justification for their action. And those are philosophies that, again, will have to be contextualized. And when it comes to health, then we have to put that in the context. Yes, you do not, um, your culture does not allow you to receive um, blood or, or transfusion. But unfortunately, the alternative to that is that we may lose this patient or we, we may lose your life. So are you choosing to die when there's something that can be done? So that's where you intervene, knowing where the patient or the person is coming from. And finally, theonomy is the, the, the use of religion 
to explain right or wrong. This is this is highly debatable. Um, when people say this is what the holy book says, um, this is what my spiritual leader says. Before you proceed, I will need a prayer. I will need an intervention. Or yes, you've given me medicine. Yes, you've recommended a transplant. But I believe this is prayer can can be uh, used here. And the reason I defaulted is because I went for for prayers or things like those we encounter. It, it's important to be conscious of all these backgrounds so that you also as you bring in your expertise, your scientific and your professional expertise, then you know where to address the challenges. What is the need for organs globally? So this is the data from the United States. As of now, and probably this is even more, 100,000 people are waiting for an organ transplant. So they've been told your liver, your kidney is, is gone. And the only way is um, get a transplant. Or if it's kidney, you're doing another renal replacement therapy modality, like dialysis. But ultimately, you'll benefit from uh, a kidney. So you're, you're on that waiting list. And every 10 minutes, somebody is added to that list. That's why I'm saying it's, there's a plus on it. But the same concept is on average every day, 22 people die waiting for that life-saving organ. And when you're talking about organ donation, especially the diseased organ donation, where you can give um, multiple organs, Eight lives can be saved by just one person donating. I will show you how we arrive at those. Um, and the tissues, which are now um, more specialized uh, entities, cornea, um, bone, those other tissues. Actually, one donor can help 75 uh, people. So when you think of all these possibilities, then when we come to deciding whether you will do nothing or offer to donate something which will not cause you um, harm, I believe you will have that uh, to remember. And what are some of those general ethical concerns? And the first one is the whole business of transferring organs from healthy persons. Should we even bother? Should we even delve into that? Should we just leave nature or God the way he created things or the way things were in existence? Why should we transfer or experiment with moving the things from one person to another? Is it sustainable in the first place? Or do we have volunteers who come and conduct a camp and then they they leave without having uh, sorted everyone on that uh, waiting list or without creating uh, capacity for the system to sustain itself as it were. And the service itself, does it satisfy the criteria of being affordable, acceptable, and accessible. We know that National Health Insurance Fund now has another name, but has been covering organ transplant, especially uh, a kidney, that's the commonest. But then that does not, that is not the end of the cost of care. After after treatment, after the successful transplant, the recipient has to be on therapy, immunosuppressive, motivative therapy to ensure that there's no rejection. And this costs 
money. This has not been covered. So is this something for consideration or legislation or the regulation to extend that cap? And the health economists have done uh, their, their permutations. If year one, someone, you know, two people, one, both of them have uh, renal failure, one started on dialysis, the other one um, dialysis for a short while as we prepare the transplant and they, they get a transplant within the first one year, follow them up for five years. The patient or the person on dialysis will probably drop off from, you know, productive activity from the third, fourth year, will completely become dependent on other people. They need to be willed, transported to the dialysis unit and back. The person who received the kidney transplant will resume their normal activity. And we know that dialysis does not cover all the functions of the kidney. So there are things which even you're getting um, efficient dialysis will still only benefit from a live uh, kidney. So in those five years, the impact to the economy individually to this person, if it was a breadwinner, for example, or even to the national economy. So is it ethical to cover part of that service, just dialysis, and not cover um, you know, post-transplant care? Because we know productivity, GDP, we want everyone to be productive. So why not extend that cover to even post-transplant care? That's just an example. So those are the factors to consider for that level of decision-making policy. And when it comes to living donors, I should have said that when it comes to organ donation, you can give as a living donor or as a diseased donor. Living donor is like you do for, um, one can donate one of their kidneys to a recipient who is a relative or just what you call altruistic. You don't really care who receives it. You just want to give it for humanity. Um, the way we do for blood, although blood is considered as a tissue, but same principle, a healthy male can give, can donate blood uh, up to four times in a year, and they will not lose much. They regain their plasma volume within 48 hours. They regain their red blood cell mass and indices within uh, three, three, three months, and they're ready to do the same with 10% of the blood volume, giving up a, a unit is 450 ml out of a uh, blood volume of 4,500 ml roughly. So that's something one can do. Um, and this is where you need uh, now the informed uh, consent as the first issue. When you're giving an organ, this you consider for the recipient and also for the for the for the donor. Um, who should donate? Is it only related um, donors? Or can you get somebody there who is not related, pay them or settle the agreement somewhere out there and just show up at, at the transplant center as a willing donor and willing recipient? The recipient will usually most of the times be willing. Um, what are the details of this procedure? How long will it take? Will, it, will I resume work? Will I, how long will it take for recovery? And for both the recipient and the donor, will there be any morbidity? There has been situations where uh, donors have um, something that is familial or um, congenital that will manifest later so that while they might donate uh, willingly, but then if it's a kidney, the, the remaining kidney uh, gets disease at some point because of a late manifestation, uh, for example, a polycystic kidney, for example, um, and how should be the follow-up costs? So all these are, are issues that are taken care of uh, at the transplant coordination center, like the one we have in Kenya National Hospital in Moitich and Faro Hospital and all the other hospitals that are doing 
um, transplant service. This has to be very clear. The history has to be taken very carefully so that we are not having a long list of creating more harm, getting donors from the same family, but they have something that's familial, to end up turning all of them into, again, disease, I mean, recipients, potential recipients. And the follow-up costs, I wouldn't want to belabor. I've already talked about where insurance, national insurance can come in and cushion uh, for both donor and recipient. And I've touched on undue influence. We've seen on social media or mainstream media situations where it's, you know, it's considered that, or it's rumored that, you know, some of those donors, uh, you know, they were not really willing. And with the current you know, rising cost of living and desperation, we have seen people, the public, coming and asking. I've heard you guys are buying organs or donating organs. Can I give mine and for in exchange for some for something to 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 live on or to take care of my family with? Every week, every day, the nephrologist here, the, anyone who coordinates uh, transplant services and generally healthcare workers, I believe you must have had this encounter. Is that just the pressure of cost of living, or is it really um, based on the altruistic uh, kind of giving where you really want to um, go ahead and net? And then finally, the registries and waiting list. I alluded to that earlier when we have two sets of registers. So you can register as a potential donor, especially for the diseased donation, which I will touch on next. That we have this number of people who have offered that if at any point of time they they are you know they are dead brain dead or like one of my colleagues um, says you know dead dead you know uh, because we find some of the tissues can only be uh, given when someone has has, has died you cannot give your heart literally, forget about the Valentine one, cannot give your heart and still continue living. So if, if that was to be allowed, then it will be a way of suicide. You take my heart and give it to someone I deeply love, then it means one of us, myself, the donor will die. But then I can say, if I'm involved in a serious accident or serious disease that declares me dead, brain dead, but they're healthy organs, I'm, I'm ready. So there's a register for donors. And then there's a waiting list or a register for recipients who have um, been, you know, the organs are in head organ um, damage and irreversible. So they also, uh, in terms of how they presented, um, they are on that register. Who should manage that register? Who should take charge of that? How transparent should it be? Because then someone can manipulate that and pump up a name that was maybe number 20 to bring it up to uh, you know, uh, some nearer. So those are the considerations as we look at the regulations around that. And for the Disease donors, first I'd just like to show you some statistics. It might be a strange thing for us in Kenya and in Africa, but the greatest yield, for, we have seen how the list of the, the, the waiting list for organs is, is, is long. We may not have the accurate data, I do not have the accurate data for Kenya, but at least every week we know around uh, between uh, six to 10 uh, transplants kidney transplants are happening. Um, and that shows you that there's, there's, there's a growing need for, for organs. Um, and if we were to take those organs from the living donors only, clearly we would not satisfy that demand. So those are some of the countries that have um, 
you know, very high rates of by diseased organ donors. These are where we have systems, legislation, and um, the moral provisions for people to offer themselves. Um, once they die, their organs can be retrieved um, and, and used to help other people in that waiting list. There's no African country on, on that list. And definitely Kenya is not on that list, but my prayer and wish is that we use this as an inspiration, especially considering that we have a problem and we have an ethical solution. So a diseased donor can help or save the lives of up to eight people, the lungs, the heart, the liver, pancreas, kidney, two kidneys, bone, and skin. And the way this happens is that you do not go in and pick just one organ and then bury the rest or, or dispose the rest. Again, it will not be unethical. Assuming this person has all these organs healthy, maybe it's a road traffic accident, he has severe head injury, and the rest of the body is, is okay. The system, the internal organs are okay. So ideally, there is a waiting time where uh, such a patient will be taken to a critical intensive care unit. Um, of course, with the consent, first confirming that is on the register for, for donors and the next of kin have been informed. You will not, not just collect somebody and go ahead and retrieve their organs. Uh, next of kin is there, and I'm glad that we have some legal practitioners in the meeting. These are just like the the um, the wills and the other documents that we hand over the power of attorney. These are documents that are filed and well known. We are not letting them sign at that point that let them be donors. But this is also where the opt-in or opt-out strategies um, or policies come in. Because nobody knows when such a thing will happen. You can prevent, do your best, but then truly accidents do happen. So is that is it better to leave it? That, uh, but the default is that um, I'm in unless I opt out. Or should we wait for people to, if, if they have never talked about it, never written it, never documented, then do not touch them. Do not talk about it at that point. So ideally that that, that period, uh, the patient is being um, circulatory and um, ventilatory support. Ethically, that's what we call not life support because when you, when you talk about life support, then it, the opposite is death. But we are saying that this is circulatory and respiratory support to ensure that all the organs are perfused well and they are ready for um, retrieval if the person has given that consent. And then you should look at the register. What is the registry looking like for the liver? There are five people, 10 people, 20 people. Somebody needs a kidney, maybe many more. Uh, others need a pancreas, somebody need a heart. So as we go in to retrieve the organ, we have teams for all these organs to ensure that they can be safely um, retrieved and transported. Because again, these are the recipients are not likely going to be in one center. And the register is a national register. Um, we are not going to have the recipients there. So this is again where policy comes in. Um, looking at the system of dispatch and re delivering these organs to where they are needed. So that's how such an organized system can work. However, there are also issues around diseased donors. The, di the directives we've been talking about, did I make a will, did I decide um, and even if I did not, is there someone who can make a decision on my behalf, a surrogate decision maker or proxy? So these are legal um, provisions that are there. I can do an advanced directive. It can be put 
on a driving license database or uh, information or a record in, in a hospital or in a medical file that such a person who comes in and we have directives like do not resuscitate or things like those which then can be filed and they are honored. We've already seen dilemmas in, 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 in Kenya in their practice. I'm sure you've seen where somebody will do, you know, this is what their wish was, but whose property are they once they die? We've seen where, yes, they say they want to be cremated, but again, morality and, um, and ethics. In our culture, we do not cremate, so we are going to disregard that directive. So consent can be given by way of, of such, and it's good to contextualize. This will call for a family conference, a family meeting, who is the closest person to this person? And you know, what would be in the best interest for the what would they do? Someone who knows them very well, and there's a way the hierarchy goes, like you wouldn't skip a spouse or a child to listen to an uncle or a cousin uh, to give you a surrogate decision for this, this person. And then definition of death. Again, when is really somebody dead? When you found someone just lying on the road, they're not breathing, um, you pronounce them dead, and anyone can do that. But there is that declaration by a qualified medical personnel who has done the required tests and confirm that really there's levels of death. So there's circulatory death, there's, there's, um, there's, there's brain death. So that again has to be put in, in um, very clear regulation and legislation. Conflict of interest is very key ethically. The same doctor declaring death cannot be the same doctor retrieving the organ and the same doctor transplanting the organ. So those are three teams that are supposed to be blind to each other. And this is where, again, our profession, professional ethics come in because we, we know, we will know who needs a kidney. It's not hard for those who deal with these patients because you have been taking care of a patient for years. You know very well if they found a kidney today, they have better outcomes. So will you now uh, collude with uh, others? Remember the decision of um, uh, pushing the fat guy off, off the, the bridge? The last example I didn't give you is you are in casualty and you, you, know, you know you have like five patients who need organ in your ICU and some, some healthy thug has just been brought you know, he's going to spend life in, in prison, clearly, he has murdered somebody. So would you go ahead and, uh, you know, sedate him or do something that causes death? And you have five, you can help eight. You have, you have only five. So what is the eth ethical thing to do? But that was just for you to think philosophically. So conflict of interest, the regulations, and this is already um, something that's being worked on uh, through the Kenya transfusion and, and tissue transplant um, authority. So that it's very clear who does what and how is it kept ethical. And the distributive justice is where I talked about, you cannot just go in and pick a kidney and then dispose. If somebody had declared um, themselves a, a, a donor, a diseased donor, given consent, then you would ideally be you know, wasting a resource, so to speak, if you only go for one and um, discard the others or dispose of the others when there are still people waiting. And that is in context with the last point, the number of organs to receive from one, one donor. So as we approach confusion, there are several myths that you know people already have, probably you may have, I've not gone through the chat or the Q&A. Um, and then I've just picked a few that are close to our practice. 
So I saw on TV that doctors will let me die if they know I'm a registered donor. Just the way it happens with the will. If, if um, you know, a, a, a child, uh, you know, a, a son, a daughter, the, the father has disclosed their will to them and they know they are going to inherit this property or they're going to inherit this account. You know, we have had stories, I've not verified, but we've had stories of, you know, people just stage money, finding ways of these guys to, you know, get 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 out of the way by dying so that they the will comes into play. Um, so again, ethically, um, for anyone with this myth, I believe no doctor or health care worker will, will do that. And for, for us, the doctors, I'm sure that uh, this will not be uh, something we, we should do because we are bound by our professional ethics. Um, so this decision to withhold or we withdraw care, especially you know critical care, when there is futility, you're not sure that will be benefit. But will you do that faster because you know this is someone we can get organs from? You know those are some of the things uh, that will go through our minds. And this is how to tell them that you know we have nothing to do with the, this is where the conflict of interest. The doctors attending to any patient should not be the ones, you know, to to make they can they can take one of the teams, but not all of them. And it's only a consideration or a discussion when someone has already been declared dead. So it comes into play that time. So what should we do? I'll start thinking about these are discussions that are not just limited to organ donation. Um, before we get to organ, there is also tissue, and the commonest tissue we donate and give is blood. And we've had complaints of uh, patients saying we donated our blood, but then we are we're still being told our patient does not receive that blood. And we may have had a situation where first the blood was not compatible with um, with the, the recipient, or if it was, then that utilitarian situation, just as we were beginning the transfusion for someone who was somewhat stable, a mother just ruptured the uterus and went into shock and they are going to die if nothing is done. And that single unit that was available was given to that particular mother and both her and the life of the baby has been saved. So did the hospital team do a right thing or a wrong thing? to give that blood to patient who in their considered opinion, opinion was deserving. So how do you do those um, regulations? Hospital ethics committees are a key, and that is just the constitution of it. Always remember, it's not just the scientists, because if you only have um, you know, the transplant Surgeons, for example, they will, they, you know, they, they have a bias on the, the way they might make their decision. If you only have lay people, again, they will take this discussion to a, a different angle. So it's recommended that you have such a composition. Um, and lastly, remember, if you do not do anything, still uh, there, is, there is a problem. But is intervention that can be done at prevention level, promotion level, and social justice, as I would like to call it. So by the time somebody loses their kidney, they have had probably uh, controlled diabetes. Um, hypertension can be because of renal disease or also can cause the renal disease itself. What we are saying is that there would have been an opportunity to pick this earlier. Now, this is where the primary health care comes in. People well-being promote, um, you know, health promotion and, and screening of preventable. Well, preventable might not be the word here, but picking pre primary prevention or promoting behavior or activity or diet that prevents 
organs to fail in the first place. If somebody is continuing to smoke, they are on their line to you know, developing a lung condition. If they have cancer, probably they're not a good candidate. They're not a candidate at all for transplant because cancer itself is, is probably a contraindication. Um, but then what are the practices? Alcohol, for example, and the liver. And uh, one ethical dilemma I remember reading about is when you have a waiting list and one of the guys is waiting for their third transplant for liver, every time he gets a transplant, he, you know, he, he comes healthy and he goes ahead and continues to drink heavily, the same drinking that led the liver to fail in the first place. So should you bypass him and go to somebody who is coming for a first transplant? Should that be a consideration? What would you advise the committee if you are the one in it? So those are some of the considerations. Promotion, uh, nobody telling people that some of the things you're doing are not good. Um, and then finally, uh, the universality, remember access, affordability, and uh, acceptability of services. For the policymakers to just enlarge that umbrella to cover um, everyone and cushion against catastrophic health expenditure, that is really the definition of, of UHC. So I would like to stop at that and just encourage us to you know, feel free to examine any decision that we make ethically. Socrates said that an, an examined life is, is not worth living. Do not just want to be the final decision. You know? Contextualize that, go the extra mile of getting into the culture, the context, the understanding of this person who is refusing an admission or refusing a procedure, know where they're coming from. It is the ethical duty that we have. Thank you so much, and over to you, Fleming. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ari, for that wonderful presentation and uh, expose on uh, uh, transplantation. Now, from uh, the presentation, I can uh, 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 summarize perhaps uh, the, 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 the presentation into three. Now, one, we have uh, the dead donor rule that uh, uh, Daktari has uh, so well elucidated uh, on. For example, when a vital organ is to be transplanted, the death of the donor shall have been determined by at least one physician other than the recipient uh, uh, physician. So that in making this particular determination, the ethical physician is supposed to use all the available uh, uh, tools and currently accepted scientific uh, tests uh, to address the same. And uh, secondly, my understanding from uh, uh, this presentation is that there is the rule of the consent that uh, for a consenting deceased, all those particular cells, tissues, and organs that may be removed from the bodies of the deceased persons uh, for the purposes of transplantation are acceptable if any consent that is required by way of law is obtained, that's first. And secondly, if there is no reason to believe that the deceased person objected to such particular removal. Uh, the other... Uh, um, uh, uh, thing that I obtained in terms of the presentation is that we have also the consenting living uh, uh, donors where live donations are acceptable when the donors are informed and voluntary uh, consent is also obtained. Now, Dr. Terry went ahead to give us how to uh, the details of how to obtain uh, this particular consent, and he noted that uh, full discussion of the proposed uh, procedure must be uh, told to the recipient and uh, the recipient's uh, perhaps responsible uh, relative if, uh, if they are there. So it was important or it is important that we have all these particular uh, consents obtained. Then he has also uh, uh, spoken about a fair transplant rule where he has talked about the allocation of organs, cells and tissues 
should be guided by clinical criteria and ethical norms rather than financial and other considerations. And these are guided by the WHO guiding principles, which I believe all of you are aware of. Now, so much for that. Uh, maybe we come to questions and answers. And the first question perhaps posed to you, Dr. Terry, is, in a scenario where client X wants to donate one of his or her kidneys for financial grounds and opt to remain with one kidney, what are the ethical considerations in that case? Over to you, Dr. Terry. Thank you very much. Uh, for that question by Diwa, and I would like to take it with another one that is, uh, what's your take on commercial transplant that I've seen lower down? Sure, sure. So this is not um, provided for, at least in our current jurisdiction in Kenya, and also what you call the, um, the, the, the declaration of Istanbul, which guides uh, transplant activities universally or globally. And for the ethical reasons that we have given. Um, so for financial grounds, how do we value, you know, when, when, you're, when you're giving land or uh, property that you have, we have valuation uh, systems that Somebody can go and this car was manufactured in this. This is the appreciation or depreciation. How would you value on which grounds will you actually use to compensate um, this person? So that one is usually um, not acceptable. There is no such thing like commercial. Uh, so you leave the donor and the client to, to have an altruistic agreement. And as it is in Kenya, this is only allowed from um, living donors, sorry, related donors, because that way, then you can at least um, establish that this is, there is no financial or gainful uh, uh, consequence to, to this. So those are the ethical considerations. Somebody might want to say, I need a million, I need an, an acre of land, I need, um, I deserve uh, two acres or whatever financial um, milestone they want to, to attach. So that currently is not uh, feasible allowed in, in Kenya and it, it, will, it has some ethical consequences. One might be desperate to say, okay, I just need a hundred thousand. And you know, someone can easily exploit that. But as you said, you, in as much as you can live healthy with one, one, one kidney, because well, that's what has been given as an example, selling it for 100,000 is, is probably considered um, exploitative and there is no amount that you can attach for adequate compensation. So as it were, then it's, it's a commercial option for transplant services is, is not a, a consideration that ethically uh, feasible. Thank you. Next question. The next question I can uh, uh, see. Uh, do we have legislation that protects a recipient uh, rights? Uh, uh, perhaps, Doctor, you want to attempt that? Or I'll come to it. No, uh, uh, I think that's that that's a legal. Uh, I, I would I would let you take that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let 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 me let me let me answer that. Uh, really, um, if you look at the legislation surrounding uh, uh, organ transplant and organ donation, including tissues. We have the overarching laws such as uh, the Constitution. We have the Health Act that speaks to all these particular uh, elements, but not in detail. Now, the reason why uh, perhaps this particular uh, CME is uh, brought on board is to first and foremost uh, uh, begin by creating awareness amongst uh, uh, the clinicians or the health service providers 
on uh, the importance of why organ donation is key. Now, if you look at, for example, uh, uh, the Constitution on the right to health, it speaks uh, broad on the issues of rights of patients. Now, secondly, the, we are not supposed to, uh, th though we have patients who are coming in to either receive uh, uh, organs and, and, and donate organs, they are still subjected to the rights and responsibilities of the general patient. But per se, there is no specific right that accrues to uh, an organ donor or a, an organ recipient. Now, if it is the obligation of the hospital to provide uh, uh, a quality healthcare service, which is safe for the patient, that is a standard that the hospital or a health service uh, providing institution must achieve, irrespective of whether the individual is coming in as a recipient or a donor. So the standard per se is general in nature, the duty of care that uh, uh, comes or boils down to the rights of the individuals are generally christened. But when it comes to specific issues as to donation of organs, uh, we are still uh, moot in terms of the ideas. So forums such as this uh, brings in stakeholders to enable us enrich the legislation per se. So there is no specific uh, right that goes to uh, 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 to um, uh, legislative right that accrues to the organ donor, but the general. So if it is you are going in as a recipient, you are going in as 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 uh, as a donor. What is the standard of care that you expect from that institution? Expect from that particular doctor? It is the general standard that is expected for every patient who is required to uh, 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 obtain all these particular services from the hospital. Though legislation speaks of organ donation, tissue donation, like the blood transfusions and the rest, but it does not go specific to the issues that we are talking about today. Now, we, it is important also to note that there is a regulatory body that has been put in place in Kenya that is supposed to oversee uh, 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 transplantation and policy uh, 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 frameworks that would enable us to enrich the legislation over and above the specific legislation that deals with uh, that deals with uh, um, uh, health service provision. Now, I've I've seen there is a specific one, though it's escaping my mind, that allows uh, uh, for organs uh, to be retrieved from a cadaver either for the purposes of teaching and even for the purposes of transplantation. But regulations that uh, breathe life into this particular uh, uh, legislation have not been put into, into practice. So it calls on us, the uh, health service providers, to be proactive in terms of uh, 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 coming in to help in terms of uh, coming up with the legislation and processes that address these particular issues. Again, what I've seen uh, specific hospitals doing is to develop over and above the general legislation that we have is to develop um, standard of, uh, operating procedures that regulates or governs each and every aspect of healthcare service provision. If it is, uh, for example, in the renal unit, you are involved in the uh, kidney transplant, what are you supposed to be uh, looking out for, especially when you are confronted with a donor, a recipient, so that somebody does not just walk uh, to your transplantation center and say, this is my relative, this particular individual has come in, uh, perhaps maybe to donate uh, 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 a kidney for myself or even for one of us. Now, the reason why I indicated that this is uh, uh, a multi requires a multi-sectoral approach is that of late we have been receiving uh, various uh, requests, which uh, has um, ensured that we activate not just uh, the healthcare service providers, but also the security teams to also come and in investigate some of these particular individuals. For example, people present uh, fake documents that uh, uh, connotes that they are related when they are not, that's one. Uh, also, we have had instances where 
people have been admitted uh, to the hospital for the purposes of verifying that a procedure that they had in a previous hospital was not just a, a, a procedure, but a procedure meant to harvest one of the organs. For example, uh, like right now, we are dealing with a case where the authorities are involved. Uh, a surgery happened in at a hospital X, but then later in the day, uh, the individual develops complications uh, to the effect that either one of the organs is not uh, functioning fully or has gone kaput totally. So the hospital is approached or has been ordered to uh, uh, do scans to uh, find out if indeed one of the organs was severed or taken away during a, a particular procedure. So you could have the health act regulating the rights of the patient, but you could also have all those particular legislations that speak to the criminality aspects also coming in, requiring the investigations of uh, the police, the CID, to uh, stem uh, organ harvesting and so on. So there's a whole lot of uh, legal instruments that can be called upon, but you have to contextualize the situation. If, for example, we are talking about the medical legal issues that arises out of a procedure in organ transplant, you'll have to look at all those particular rights that accrue from there within. But if you are looking at it from a criminal perspective, you have also to look at the legal uh, 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 legislations that speaks to the criminality element. So I'll 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 I'll, I'll pend that question at that particular uh, point unless that's very. Thank you, Akili. I think uh, you, you, you've you dealt with it comprehensively, so probably you can take a few other questions on the okay. chat. Now, okay. Now, uh, the other question is, why is it that the next of kin can override one's decision to donate after one is deceased, brain dead if one had stated that they wish to be the donor? That's one. I think it's for you, Dr. Ari. Then the other one, are we able to do lung transplant here in Kenya? Then what is the ethical procedure for organ transplant on a case scenario of family coercion? Good questions, very nice question. So um, overriding the decision, I think, like we said, remember law, morality and ethics. Um, what is enforceable is law. And as long as there is law that either prohibits or uh, you know, does not allow some procedures to take place or it's silent on that, then somebody can always challenge or contextualize or discuss the other scenarios. And this is where the the, the context is important. So look at what the person wished. Yes. For now, you know, when there is the will and they have already committed in writing, there's a there's a there's a witness, there's a legal practitioner uh, who is custodian of that, then it's easy to, in, to enforce that. But part of the legislation that is being developed and also the re regulations for the same is to allow that. Wakili will remind us, but I think even, even just plugging a machine, for example, um, just switching off cardiac or respiratory support, I'm not sure that we have the legislative framework for that. So somebody can challenge a, a practitioner who, who goes ahead and succumbing to family pressure or their suggestion. Uh, does the same. So there are some things which will now be uh, overridden. So you cannot take somebody to court for overriding or saying that instead of cremating, we want to have a decent burial. This is where utilitarianism comes in, that this is their wish, but this is our community. This is how we do. But as long as something is legalized, 
and there's the, the, an existing, then with the autonomy, if someone made that uh, wish, because well, that's where you go to, when they were making this wish, were they of a sound mind? Were they adults? Were they, did they have testamental capacity? Did they have a witness? Again, who is someone with the best interest? Uh, it would be interesting to bypass a relative or a close family to go ahead and uh, you know get someone who is a distant neighbor who they lived with. And, and this is the person now who said, you know, I heard him say, oh, I saw in witness. So it has to be contextualized and it has to be uh, discussed. Remember, it's not again an issue of uh, life and death for this person we are talking about. It might be a question of life and death for another person on the waiting list, but the best interest of this person who we have to make a decision of taking their organs or not, then uh, there has to be that consideration um, for the best interest. You, it can work the other way, like if a funeral is going to cost millions and this person just wished for a simple uh, uh, ceremony, which again was done in, 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 in good uh, state of mind and witnessed, then somebody can, I believe, get uh, an order just to proceed as the person willed. And if it is confirmed, it was not a forgery, it was not uh, something that has come up, then why would you subject the community or the family to such expenses when really the person wished otherwise. Um, so the other question was, um, which was the other question I'm trying to scroll. Uh, is something again so override cultural issues overriding ethics? Who needs to be consented in the African coast context? The dead are on. I think I've, I've answered that, and not just the household. But remember, that's where the law empowers. And this is where also, uh, because we also know not, not all African uh, practices or cultures uh, you know, are going to be when you weigh the benefits versus the harm. It really has to be uh, contextualized. Because there are those who say, when a man dies, then the wife has to be inherited by someone. I wouldn't want to go that direction for now. But it's the same way we wish to be uh, for them to be treated. What is the best interest in terms of safety and the outcomes? Uh, are we able to do lung transplants here in Kenya? Not yet, but uh, believe that in the foreseeable future, for now we are able to do kidney transplant and uh, I think we are personnel for liver transplant as well. And the tissues, of course, we are not mentioning tissues today because they are it's a bit broad, but the commonest tissue is the cornea, Cornea, because I've seen a question on, on the cornea. Uh, cornea can only come uh, from a dead or a diseased donor. As, as we said, uh, this is an organ, this is a tissue. If you give, then you're not able to see. Yeah. So you can only give that, you know, from a disease situation. Uh, but cornea transplants are happening. We have the experts. And unfortunately, we have to import those corneas. Um, from the US and India, those are the commonest, but they are, they, are, they are happening and we have recipients who have testified during the, you know, the, the transplant day. We are going to probably remind ourselves on when that will be. And they are there within us because there are some causes of blindness that are caused because they're caused by corneal injury. So, that can only come from the disease donors. And this is really one of the, the driving uh, motives for, for this awareness, because the cornea is like a protector, a screen protector for your, for your eye. And what we, what we say is that, because people raise all sorts of concerns. Are you removing all eyes? Are you going to gorge out the eyes? And how will someone be viewed or buried? Remember, it's just the, the, the top load layer, and that can be done in a way that permits what people call um, open casket barriers. You can still view. Nobody is uh, viewed with their eyes open. So the leads and all that can be safely done, and the corneas can be safely, um, like you can give someone else a lease of uh, vision uh, just by that uh, donation. So that's one that can have, you know, a benefit. And the cornea is immunologically uh, inert, so 
you know, do not arise so many issues of cross match or rejection. Um, it is one that is really um, checks for any related or non-related. Um, ethical procedure for organ transplant in the family coercion. I think we talked about that. We we cannot also have a family forcing that his son who has been errant is just ruined, is, is, is just someone who is useless in the family. So now when the father needs a, a kidney, we are presenting this one to you, Dr. This one, this one you can cure for. It's, it's not ethical. We still need to uphold the, the autonomy of, of this um, donor. They have to be um, you know, willing and they have to give um, altruistically. And the reverse is also true. Now, the one who has given does not have to have any special consideration from the rest. Now that he's the one who gave the kidney, then he becomes the greatest beneficiary uh, for the estate of the, 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 the father. Uh, again, that has to be balanced. You may not get involved in the backgrounds, but at least at the hospital level, that the, the regulations that Wakili took us through, you cannot later on come five years later and say, Dr. I gave my kidney to this son, but now I see his, uh, or vice versa, I gave my kidney to my dad, but he has not given me land, so please take it back and put it back to me. That that cannot that cannot be done. That will not be ethical and that will not be permitted. Once you give, then you're given. So all that counseling is not as easy as you are saying now, but it's 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 a procedure um, that the counseling department also has to take through, and also the legal in those transplant committees, like the ethics committees, we've seen their all representations to ensure that everyone is adequately informed. Uh, Dr. Ruth Mudama talks about making sure the dead donor role is not exploited. Yes. For sure. And that is the other reason I was talking about costing or attaching a financial um, value to an organ. Because what would that happen? Uh, what would that mean? That you know, people can abuse, people can get kidnapped, and uh, their organs, you know, uh, procured without their, their consent, just because we know that once you bring a kidney, then there's a million. Once you bring a liver, then there's five million. You know, if that was commercialized, then definitely you you, you might have an oversupply, but through the, the black market. And we are not saying this does not happen, but there's a very strong security network. Um, again, stemming from the declaration of Istanbul, which requires everyone who is doing transplant to actually publish and announce and declare where the donor and the recipient came from. And so it's something that is really networked uh, country. Because someone asked why we have more demand in the Western or European countries. Um, I believe first, the, not really about demand, but we know that there are more transplants happening there because of advanced systems. So while in Kenya, we only have a few, I would say a few because compared to the demand, we should probably have these services running in every county, but we probably have it on the national hospitals and uh, a few of the private um, faith-based institutions. Uh, so in the, in the Western countries, this is more advanced. I think the leading is probably um, Turkey. Um, and they have more specialists, more, more capacity. And, and so the, the services are happening more there. Demand, I believe we, we have we have some level of demand as well, probably not as, as well compared, but do we really know, like I was saying, is there social justice to ensure that every person who needs renal replacement has been adequately evaluated and they are known? Um, we have patients presenting very late at, at failure, while in other countries you can actually have preemptive, uh, you can tell that this kidney is going to fail at this month, and so we start preparing for you. Uh, from this point. I think that's what I can see from my end. Um, Wakili, is there anything else uh, I've left? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Perhaps maybe one last round uh, of questions given the time. Uh, Brian Nyagaka asks, uh, thanks, Dr. for wonderful presentation. In light of the emerging technology, such as xenotransplantation and organ engineering, 
what ethical principles should guide the development and implementation of these innovative approaches to organ transplantation? And how can we ensure that these technologies are used responsibly and ethically to maximize benefits and minimize harms uh, from patients and society? What are your views on that? And while you answer that, there are so many questions surrounding consents especially on uh, children or those individuals who are unable to uh, give uh, consents to transplantation. Perhaps maybe you may speak about consent uh, as an ethical issue and how perhaps maybe it may be obtained if yes or no, and uh, uh, on behalf of uh, the donor, a donor who is uh, underage or cannot consent because of one or two reasons as we wrap up. Thank you very much for those uh, good questions. I begin with the xenograft. Uh, it falls in the category of what you call scientific frontiers and the ethics around scientific uh, frontiers. We've, we saw a lot of that during the pandemic when we had um, vaccines that, that we've never had um, and molecular level research going on. So a xenograft is a tissue and organ that comes from a donor of a different species. So it means we can probably uh, get some tissue from um, a chimpanzee or, or some some other species. Um, how how what would be the ethics about that? So just like we handle research ethics, any vulnerable group of, um, let's just say, creation of organs. Because these are living things. In as much as they're not human beings, they also have their own um, requirement for consideration. Even animal research is now um, heavily regulated. Like, do you really have to experiment on on um, on mice or on, on those other creatures? Will it cause them harm? Um, and then in line also with the 3D uh, printing of organs and, and those other regenerative molecular uh, technologies. So the ethics for that is, is a bit complex because now you are not dealing with someone who can give consent or, or not. Um, and you're looking at potential for harm, or potential for, um, for benefit. And if by engineering, um, you know, biologically, you can culture uh, tissues or organs, you can culture livers and get those to, to transplant. It would be um, a welcome uh, intervention medically. But then again, we go back to there will be cost involved in that. Would it be sold? And at how much? Um, who will be compensated in case you are retrieving a cornea, for example, from another animal? Um, and what will be the measure or the extent of harm to that? So we have all sorts of uh, considerations to make, but I believe there is no hard and fast boundaries between ethics and, and science. As we advance the frontiers, every time things move, remember, if the, the first, first of these interventions were done um, very early in, in the 50s and the 40s when we had the first transplants, and there were some unforeseen uh, things and considerations then. So I would say ethics is dynamic, and as long as the, you can apply one of those philosophies and theories we talked about, you can demonstrate that there is more benefit than um, harm to this. We are not going to, uh, to do a raw cloning or engineer something which eventually will become a monster and become a challenge for the medical uh, practice, as it were. Um, we're not going to grow um, uh, tissues by, by 3D printing that that will be made so commercially you know inaccessible that only the rich can can access or they may have 
unforeseen um, effects to the recipient later, then that would be a consideration to make. Um, for children and those donors who have no um, capacity to, to consent, historically, the first kidney donation was actually um, between an identical twin who was saving his, his, his twin brother. And those were children, but these are now siblings. And the good thing is that there was not much in terms of rejection or compatibility because these are genetically uh, identical. So it was easy to go through and it was easy to demonstrate that there is benefit to life is benefit to this recipient and the, the donor will also remain. But it becomes complex now when the parent, the child who is under 18 and we're really pushing for, for the child to, to donate. And some is the other way around. The child really wants to save the life of, of, of the, the parent, but they are underage, they cannot um, consent. So there, the good setting also for an ethics um, consideration um, that if there are other people, you know, in the family or the recipient himself, I've seen recipients who say, I wouldn't want to bother anyone or my children. I'd rather just dialyze and go on and let God decide what happens to me. So I would contextualize that, establish that this child is not being uh, coerced. I have had even colleagues giving uh, their organs to their parents, um, and one would consider them probably at that time too young to take such a decision. But medically, it is safe. Uh, it is life-saving. Morally, it is acceptable. Ethically, it is acceptable. It's appropriate. I would contextualize that discussion with the rest, with everyone in the family to ensure that net there is acceptance and there is benefit rather than harm. If it's only the child, and I can give another example of one I witnessed that this part, the patient was a polygamous man who had um, several children, but because of the relationship they had, none of them, none of the children really wanted to donate. But his, there was one child who had been born out of wedlock. They, the ones people call outgrowers. I don't know whether that is proper English. But this 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 son, and because he's his own son, so the HLA typing and everything was, was compatible and was appropriate. But then this is the first time everyone was knowing that this, this man had a child out there. And the question is, how do we accommodate this son? Now he has he has he has not lived well with the other children. They, are, they don't have a good relationship, but this is someone who has given him a kidney, life-saving. So does he get more property? Does he now get accommodated in, 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 uh, in the family? African culture, those who are talking about it, do we consider such uh, child part of the family? Um, and would there be an issue with that? So when it comes to family issues, I would really look at the bigger family uh, setup and just contextualize the discussion to the most optimal ethical um, outcome. And yes, the child can refuse to donate if they do not, if they do not assent, if they do not feel it's the right thing. Even if the parent has okayed it, um, if I had time, I would give you several other examples of such scenarios. A girl is 14, 15, pregnant, she wants to keep her baby, it has, but the parent wants the baby out. So who do you listen to? I will leave it at that. Akili. For well, a quick response, we will uh, also be sharing the slides as requested by many of you. Uh, uh, also, people who are concerned about the CPD points, we have taken note and we uh, picked up with that uh, the relevant authority for those that are in attendance to be 
awarded the correct CPD uh, points. Otherwise, till next time, we have another series that is coming up on 21st of February, 2024. That is from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Those who do wish to join uh, to get such enriching knowledge may uh, purpose to attend the Growing Up with Cerebral Palsy, Growth, Puberty, and Possible Pitfalls. Uh, we'll have equally fascinating panel that will take you through the discussions for that day. Until next time, uh, from the ethics team, we thank you for attending and we wish you all the best as you put into practice whatever we have learned today. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, Akili, for your excellent moderation and thank you all for attending. You're welcome.